what the current status is and whether we're sort of on the right track. Perhaps there are um, directions that we are bringing, expanding the field into, which we maybe should not be. Perhaps there's other directions that we should be investing a lot more resources on that we haven't been. So trying to understand uh, what the future is that we're currently trending towards and whether or not that is the correct future that we want. Um, so with that, um, I'll turn it to Kai to uh, walk through some logistics. Okay, thank you, Lily, for the introduction. So throughout the discussion, Lily and I will be mon monitoring the discussion and also questions. And I just post a link on, on the chat. So you will you can use the link to post your questions there. You can also add your name or, or your affiliations, or you can just leave it anonymous as, as well. And you can also upload other questions that questions other people post in the in the in the link. And we Lily and I will just check in, uh, be checking the, the, the link and also asking questions to the panelists. And yeah, and this this uh, panel discussion will be live streamed on YouTube and also will be recorded. The recording will be released afterward. So you will be welcome to like watch it offline as well. And that's yeah, that's about that's all about it, though, just it. And yeah, welcome everyone to the panel discussions. And with that, I would like to introduce our first speaker here. So uh, our first uh, panelist is Fei Fang. So Fei Fang is currently a, a assistant professor at CNU. And Fei Fang, would you mind mute yourself and then like, briefly introduce yourself to, the, to our audience? I'm happy to. And thank you for inviting me. Uh, I'm a, currently assistant professor in the School of Computer Science at Carnegie Mellon University. And prior to that, I was a postdoc at Harvard uh, CRCS. Uh, and also prior to that, I got my PhD from USC, advised by Professor Milan Tampe. Uh, and now, like, I left Harvard and Milan comes to Harvard. So that's kind of uh, what a story. Uh, and I've been working on uh, AI for social impact, integrating machine learning with game theory. Uh, when I was a PhD student, I started working on um, uh, building game theoretical models for security problems, uh, for protecting the Staten Island Ferry from potential attacks. And then later on, started the work on green security games where we use game theoretic, build game theoretical models for wildlife conservation to kind of help the conservation agencies mm, predict poaching threats and design po ranger patrols to fight against potential poachers who are poaching the uh, wildlife. And as I moved to CMU, we also started new lines of work, uh, including, um, the, including improving the efficiency of uh, operation in the food rescue platforms. And also we have been working on solving larger games, learning in games um, and uh, multi-agent reinforced learning. So that's what we have been up to. And we are really glad to see that uh, many uh, of our work got deployed and used by the stakeholders, uh, including the earlier work on ferry protection that is used by US Coast Guard and the work on wildlife conservation uh, the, together with Millennium's group and also in collaboration with several conservation agencies like WWF, WCS, they are uh, deployed and tested in Malaysia, China, Uganda, and several other countries. And then for the food rescue uh, project that we have been working on, we collaborated with 412 Food Rescue, a Pittsburgh located uh, nonprofit organization, and they have been using our algorithm for uh, volunteer notifications. So yeah, with that, I'm happy to, I'm looking forward to the discussion today. Thanks so much, Faye. Our um, second panelist is uh, Lynn Kack, who is an assistant professor of computer science and public policy at the Hurdy School in Germany. Um, her research and teaching focuses on methods from statistics and machine learning to inform climate mitigation policy across the energy sector. And she is also founder and chair of Climate Change AI, an organization to facilitate work at the intersection of machine learning and climate action. Over to you, Lynn. Thanks, yeah. Um, maybe I can just say a few words about my work. Um, so I am working in public policy and I'm mostly interested in climate change mitigation. So how we can reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And my work addresses different problems in the energy sector and also transportation and building sectors. And um, for example, I've used machine learning to monitor track traffic from satellite images 
but I've also re more recently worked on analyzing text data to inform policy making. Um, so for example, we looked at corporate annual reports and how companies talk about climate risk, risk and disclose them. And we also analyzed patents to understand um, more about um, renewable energy innovation and um, energy storage innovation. And this interest in um, machine learning started um, during my PhD at Carnegie Mellon University. Um, I did my PhD in engineering and public policy, which is already at this intersection of technology and policy. And um, I did a secondary master's in machine learning and actually Faye was one of my teachers once, I think I audited your class on AI and sustainability. Yeah. Um, and yeah, and then um, also during my um, PhD, I started combining this, um, this interest in climate policy and in machine learning. And um, around the same time, um, around three years ago, I met a number of other people who were also interested in how we can use AI to address climate change. And we wrote a large um, overview paper of how one can apply machine learning in this area and um, also ran a workshop. And based on that, we got a lot of um, interest in the topic and decided to found an NGO, NGO that's called Climate Change AI. And um, by now we have 30 volunteers and even two staff members and we run regular workshops at AI conferences and we um, have our own grants program that has just, just launched um, with a number of research projects. And um, we also supply um, other resources for people who want to work on climate change and also for policymakers and people from industry who are interested in, at this intersection. Um, yeah, so um, in terms of what I think is, what, what my interests are in terms of how we can apply machine learning and AI um, for social good is mostly focusing on decision-making and public policy um, with an, um, with a focus on gathering new decision relevant data on um, better decision making in the energy sector. Right. Thanks. Thank you, Lin, for the wonderful introduction. So, I'm also happy to introduce our third speaker today, Dinai Metasa. So, Dinai uh, is uh, received their uh, PhD from Stanford University. And Dinai is currently a postdoc at Stanford, Stanford University and is, is going to start uh, uh, an assistant professor position at, at the University of Pennsylvania soon in the next semester. And Dinai's research focuses on developing and deploying methods for studying bias and representation in algorithm and algorithmic content, content and focusing on high stack social settings like politics and employment and on the experience of marginalized people. And over to you, Dina, you can give us a brief introduction of you, Silvia. So. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you for having me here. It's really great to be on this panel with so many other wonderful speakers. Um, <clears throat> as you mentioned, I did my PhD at Stanford in computer science. I am going to be starting this summer as a professor at the University of Pennsylvania in the computer, computer and information science department, but also with a secondary appointment in Annenberg, the School for Communication. So I do interdisciplinary work that focuses on the interaction and the intersection of social inequality and technology. I study issues of bias and representation in socio-technical systems and algorithmic content. So that includes systems like search engines, social media, and other AI powered systems. And I use a variety of methods, including uh, methods like algorithm audits and systems building and behavioral social science, all towards this goal of understanding how people interact with these kinds of systems and uh, what effect it has on them and to work towards building systems that work better for people. So I'm most interested in the experiences specifically of marginalized people, both from a critical perspective, trying to understand how these systems can perpetuate or exaggerate existing social inequity, and also a liberatory one. So trying to think about what kind of technologies would better serve marginalized people in more positive ways, and then working towards making those a reality. So in the past, I've worked on auditing algorithms like Google search for the way that they represent different types of people by race and gender in the context of employment and jobs. I'm currently working on several projects, including one that's a platform for making it easier for researchers to collect observational data and run interventions on real people in browser. 
And um, of particular interest to me right now is digital advertising, uh, which, you know, maybe this sounds, I don't know, either like a boring topic or an exciting one to you, but it's, it's a super ubiquitous hundred of billion dollar industry, but it's not totally clear how or if it works and definitely not the impact that it's having on different kinds of people every day. And, you know, we all think we're not influenced by ads, but in practice, like really, actually, this is a, a type of algorithmic media that we're seeing all the time. Uh, in terms of AI for social impact, you know, I think the term is a little nebulous because AI itself is nebulous. It can refer to anything from like a regression sometimes to some deep neural nets that are, you know, built on terabytes of data. So uh, I think it's, it's worth spending some time maybe later in this panel kind of clarifying like what we consider under that umbrella. And I think social impact is also sometimes a vague term, right? Like obviously all technologies, digital and analog, have some impact on society because they're situated in society, but those impacts can be very mixed. I think it's worth looking at the nuances. Sometimes these impacts are positive for some groups and negative for others, or even down to the individual level, you know, can have positive and negative impacts on different people. And, and even, you know, for the same person can have some different positive and negative impacts. So it's worth, I think, being really precise and, um, you know, not, not grouping too coarsely in terms of people or communities. Uh, and I think that people, that the first sort of thought I have on this space is that I think it's really important if you're working in this area to lay out clear priorities for yourself, to think about this topic from a human-centered perspective. You know, I'm, I'm in a sort of HCI subfield, so that's obviously my take. Um, but to really begin with the, the impact that you want this kind of technology to have on people, and then to work backwards and think about, you know, getting back to the technology itself, what kind of technology should we be building? Or, you know, in some cases, should we even be building it? So um, I'll, I'll leave it there without getting too long-winded and, and thank you for having me. Thank you so much, Danai. And our fourth panelist today is uh, Brian Water. So mm -hmm. Brian is a Schmidt Science Fellow at Carnegie Mellon and um, joined with the Harvard School of Public Health. And this fall, he will join Carnegie Mellon as an assistant professor in the machine learning department. Brian's work focuses on the intersection of optimization, machine learning, and social networks motivated by applications to public health. Brian? Oh, thank you, Lily. And yeah, thanks very much, everyone, for, for having me here. Um, so like Lily mentioned, my work focuses you know, broadly at the intersection of AI, whatever that means, and, and public health, uh, more specifically, you know, using techniques um, drawing primarily from machine learning optimization and, and social networks to think about how we improve decision making in public health domains and ultimately improve the quality of interventions or services that are that are offered. And so from the application side, um, I've you know, spent the last few years working on projects um, like so one uh, with, with Milland, uh, who, who advised my PhD on HIV prevention for youth experiencing homelessness and figuring out how to better target um, interventions to increase access, um, to, to disseminate information about HIV prevention and ultimately increase uptake of preventative behaviors. And so we worked with drop-in centers in the Los Angeles area to design pilot and then ultimately um, evaluate this, um, this intervention in a, in a controlled trial. Um, beyond that, I've worked on problems of uh, tuberculosis treatment and more recently um, building partnerships with, um, with organizations in maternal and child health, again, with the sort of focus around understanding where they can um, basically be more effectively using computational techniques to inform the decisions that they have to make under limited resources. And so, um, and so broadly, I'm kind of interested, you know, both in that set of applications and then also the sort of methodological questions around how we you know, develop computational systems that are actually able to do that in the very non-ideal real world setting that these organizations and people often face. So uh, yeah, so thanks again for having me. Looking forward to discussing. Okay, so that's all our four speakers and that's welcome our uh, speakers again. And we will be starting our uh, discussions, uh, panel discussion. And as I mentioned before, please feel free to put your questions in the, in the link. I post a link in the chat. And Didi and I will be monitoring the questions and yeah, ask the questions for you as well. So uh, with that, I would like to kick, kick off the discussion by a very vague question. So why does AI for social impact research differ from tradition traditional models of AI research. This is like, please define AI for social impact research. And I would like to nominate our most senior, senior people, a person here, Faye, to answer this question first. 
Yeah, so why is that different? I think it is different in many different ways. Uh, the first is uh, a lot of the work that we do uh, in the under the umbrella of AI for social impact would involve collaboration with nonprofit or sometimes government sectors. And uh, that, that means it's not just that you have a well-defined problem there or you can kind of uh, sketch some new problem on paper and then start working on it. Instead, uh, you, you would need to talk to the stakeholders and to formulate the problem that really uh, take into account the practical considerations and uh, to develop, develop something that is going to be useful from the stakeholder's perspective. Um, and I think these, uh, this is one of the key differences uh, when we work on the such problem comparing to the, um, the other problems that we typically work on. And also because of this difference, uh, it would require the collaboration or, uh, or the joint effort between the researchers and the stakeholders, probably from the very beginning to the very end, like in the design of the model, design of the algorithm, uh, the, the test or evaluation of the algorithm. Throughout the way, we would need uh, such a collaborative effort um, so that we are not developing something that is not going to be useful in practice. It's just something that exists on paper and only on paper. Yeah, so yeah, indeed that's like, that's a lot different. But, it's, but I think also in industry change, you will, we might also have a similar change. Like you, you may also need to talk to domain experts to understand the questions. So from your perspective, like is that, I mean, What's the like, like a conversion rate? Like how, how often you actually deploy the algorithms? Like from, I mean, the algorithms you develop, develop for these particular social changes like by talking to the master and eventually that actually got deployed to the, to the domain to actually resolve those social changes. Yeah, that's a very good point. Uh, I think for my work, uh, what we can see is that like we choose kind of one topic or one, one, one domain and then we start investigating the problem. And of course, in this journey, uh, along the journey, not all the methods or algorithms that we develop can be deployed in practice. It is likely that some of our work get deployed. And then from that deployment, we see new challenges. And then we found that for that new challenge, there's no even fundamental studies for that problem. So we kind of try to come up with new like fundamental models uh, an algorithm for solving that. And then after that, we realized that, okay, while this is a good attempt, it's not really directly usable. So we need to go back to the uh, practical aspect again to see like why this new algorithm, new method that tries to tackle the new challenge we see is not directly usable and then adapt that new algorithm to something, uh, to, to the practical usage. Uh, and you also asked the question about like, uh, what is the difference comparing to the work that is for commercial products? Mm -hmm. um, I do see there is a, been a huge difference. Um, let me just mainly focus on the nonprofit part because for the wildlife conservation work that we do and the food rescue work we do, we're collaborating with nonprofits and they work under very different uh, like, logistics per se comparing to the companies because they're not for profit and that means their top priority is not making money and that means you cannot persuade them by oh if you use my algorithm you can increase your revenue by 10 percent so spend money and uh, human resources on this collaboration with us and let's work on it together it's very hard to do so instead they they would have their uh, own uh uh daily responsibilities and their own daily operation. And it's very likely that they are actually spending extra uh, human resources to this collaboration. And they don't know for sure how much benefit that they can gain from this collaboration. So to them, it's kind of like a, a investment of resources and like there's no direct um, kind of revenue like thing comparing to those commercial companies. And uh, so because of that, that leads to a lot of like additional obstacles on the way when we try to push things forward. And sometimes 
uh, you can expect that for those commercial collaboration, uh, co commercial applications, um, many of them would have a data scientist or software engineers already in place developing something for them. And then if you want to try out new things, you can directly work with them and to do something together. But for some of these nonprofits, they don't even have such a data scientist, software engineer there in place doing all the basic uh, kind of IT infrastructure there. So it's likely that you may need to start from scratch and to be the, the, the data scientist for them or to be the software engineer for them. So these are also the differences that we see in our uh, attempt working with different uh, nonprofit organizations. Thank you for the feedback. I think yeah, Brian might also have some experience in like working with nonprofit organization to promote uh, social challenges, like to, to improve social challenges in terms of uh, public health. Maybe Brian can also say a few words about that as well. Yeah, I mean, I think my experience is, is similar in a lot of ways. I mean, it's I mean it's a difficult process, and it, you know, I mean, it starts from the fact that there's often not really like a shared language, right? Like you know, you, you know, you as an AI person are not like a domain expert in, you know, whatever area of public health and, and definitely not that specific, um, you know, community. And so it's hard for you to pick out like exactly what are the highest impact things to be working on or what technologies like an appropriate part of the solution. And then conversely, people who have spent more time in that domain or that community, uh, you know, are almost never like sort of like have spent like a lot of time, like, you know, training in like AI or machine learning or something like that. And so they might have like a sort of general picture of AI from like reading the news or something like that, but it's hard to translate that into like a specific picture of like what could, you know, some like quantitative method do for them in particular. And so it takes a while just to build up that sort of like shared understanding, right, where you can, you know, figure out what are reasonable problems to work on in the first place. And then, um, yeah, definitely, I think the sort of, um, like the points that Faye raised about sort of like the resources that are required are are really salient, you know, in public health, you know, as well, you're, you're typically like working with governmental or nonprofit organizations. And um, so it's, it's definitely an investment of resources on their part to like engage with you in the first place and like, you know, pull together like the data set that you need or work with you to like prototype some system or, or whatever else. And then the payoff is kind of like uncertain and down the road. And, um, and I think this is, this is a challenge during like the project itself, but I think it's also an even bigger challenge for like scaling projects afterwards, which is something that's like, I don't think as a community, we really know how to do. Because even if you, you invest a lot of time in a collaboration with one organization, right? Then um, that's like, that's, that's really wonderful. Like as a means to make progress, you know, but then whatever you do is like really difficult for other people to adopt, right? Because they don't have the sort of just like, you know, yeah, like capacity in terms of like having like a data scientist on staff or something or someone who can um, really spend a lot of time like figuring out how to use whatever system you built. Um, and so figuring out how to sort of lower that barrier to entry somehow is I think very necessary. Yeah. Thanks so much, Ryan and Faye. So um, one thing that I'm gathering from both of your comments just now are the importance of working with stakeholders, especially in this deployment process. But part of deployment means that the questions that were the challenges that we're focused on are sort of these decision-making challenges about how to allocate resources or how to plan something. Um, but one thing that Faye talked about is the importance of working with stakeholders throughout the process from sort of problem scoping to design um, to deployment. As part of that, um, really there's a lot of work that has to be done in this kind of evaluation as well. And Denai, um, a lot of your work thinks about these questions of auditing. Um, so what do you think um, about what AI researchers should be doing aside from just kind of planning and predicting and these kinds of decision-making problems? And um, should we be responsible for auditing and evaluating our own systems? Um, how, and if so, how should we go about this? Yeah, yeah, this is an excellent question that I was definitely gonna wanna bring up anyway. Um, you know, my area of research, as you said, is algorithm audits. And this is a method that initially sort of was developed, auditing as a concept was developed in the social sciences and then kind of adopted by researchers in, in the tech space from subfields like HCI, cybersecurity and others. But uh, I haven't seen it really take off or be widely adopted by people who maybe consider themselves, you know, AI researchers proper. And uh, I think that 
you know, the, the major point that I try to make in my work and in general is that these kinds of systems, if they have some direct impact on people, which, you know, in this space, all of our work does, uh, it's not enough that they just work. It's not enough that the system literally functions. It needs to work for people. You know, it needs to work for those stakeholders. And so the, the idea about how to evaluate both, both um, auditing is especially useful when you don't have direct access to the system. There are other techniques that you can use to do evaluation, like running experiments and such, when you do actually have direct access to the system. But it's important that this kind of system evaluation, I think, kind of come more under the umbrella of AI and, and have it be something that's valued as an intrinsic part of doing the work itself. Um, and I really, you know, hold in high esteem the other panelists here and the way that they do this in their work. But this is something that I wish that AI as a field would sort of like, uh, you know, perhaps internalize a little more broadly. Thank you so much for uh, for pointing us to those those thoughts, um, Lynn. I wanted to ask you as on your your reaction to all of this as well, especially because so much of your work focuses on policy implications, which really kind of goes beyond deployment to thinking about how to um, do a lot of decision making on a larger scale. And I think this also um, points to to Aaron Reda's um, question in the chat, which is about um, what role government plays in um, the in the sort of regulation of AI and its social impact. So could you speak a little bit on policy? Yeah, so maybe um, a few, I, I wanted to actually address this more from the side of a domain side researcher, because I think that's, that's more what I am. I, I, I work in a policy school. Um, I have myself an ML background, but I am not a machine learning researcher by any means. Um, and from, from that point of view, um, you're mostly interested in answering the research question or addressing a problem. And um, the method comes second, right? You want to um, answer to the best possible and machine learning might be the way, but it might not be the way. So one has to be really open to, to different kinds of methods and employing also different kinds of methods. And um, you one, one struggle that I think many, many groups face is that you have to have um, the right kind of people working on the project, which both have machine learning or AI expertise and domain expertise, because they have to develop the project from, from the ground up and really understand what's going on and be willing to, you know, apply different methods, label the data, right? That's a huge challenge. Most of it is actually scoping the problem, finding the, the labeled data or creating the labeled data and then um, actually solving, like, using ML and is, is almost yeah a smaller part of the project in the end often. Um, so finding the right um, students, the right talent that is willing to work with cleaning data, labeling data, being fully immersed in the in the problem space in the domain science as well, I think is still a challenge and especially in the policy and public policy, uh, machine learning is a really new tool. Um, so um, in other areas that that's not the case, I think they're a bit further, but especially in, in public policy, it's still a rather new, um, new area or method area. So we are definitely struggling with that a little bit, or it, it's still like a barrier to really running big projects in that sense. Um, so regulating AI is a whole different space, I would say. Um, that's the, I, I always like to think of it as machine learning as a method in policy, public policy for helping um, you know, come up with insights that then help policymakers. But then there's this whole question of how do we create um, policy and governance um, institutions that um, can deal with AI um, and can help shape AI to be um, socially beneficial, which is um, a whole different area and um, also requires different skills. But also that is still rather new. I mean, the EU is currently shaping the AI Act. So that's a big legislation on the horizon where government is um, trying to regulate AI. Um, so maybe that, that's something to watch out for. But um, again, like they're, they're, I think there's much more potential for government to also help AI be um, socially beneficial. Uh, yeah, C can I just say a few words? Just following what Lynn said about uh, getting students. 
So what I see here is that uh, it is also challenging, even from the AI perspective, uh, to find students to work on these problems. Because as you said, Lin, uh, it involves a huge amount of work and extra effort beyond designing the AI method, designing the AI algorithms. And uh, these algorithms, since they are for nonprofit, not all of them are kind of, of direct usage for commercial companies. And then the, the formal aspect, meaning they need to spend a, a lot of extra time on <clears throat> beyond AI method, designing AI method and, and AI algorithm, sometimes make it make the students uh, at a disadvantage in terms of you know, publishing publications at a higher rate. Uh, and <laughs> this sometimes would make it harder for the students to you know, get a comparable publication record when they're on the job market looking for a job in academia. And the latter one, which is what they're working on, is not necessarily directly applicable for commercial companies, make, it, make them at a disadvantage when they are looking for a job in industry. So it's like for both parts, they might face some kind of challenges like this. And uh, that's also something that we face when we try to get students to work on them. Brian and I, if um, other of you have reactions. Yeah, I mean, I think this is a really excellent point. And unfortunately, it's a problem we face in all of academia, you know, not just specifically this space. There are different competing incentives for students who are, you know, trying to job market effectively, either in industry or academia, than there are for the organizations that we want to work with that are really uh, displaying a long term commitment to working in some particular domain and, and improving the lives of people in that way. Um, I would hope that you know the kinds of students and and researchers who want to do work in this space uh, understand that and are able to kind of find a line between doing the thing that it's you know seems like most mm, expedient for them in terms of their CV or or how they look on paper and then you know doing that which is actually going to make a long term impact in the world and I think that the the long term impact thing is. Uh, you know, maybe it seems like it pays fewer rewards in the short term, but I think in the long term, it really makes a bigger difference. I think most students, you know, if we're talking about graduate students, I think uh, over optimize for like the number of publications when really a smaller number of strong publications that really have some real world impact uh, are going to, you know, in, my, in the experience that I've, I've seen from people on the job market, like that actually goes a much longer way. So um, if you are interested in this space and you're worried that it's not going to let you play the game of academia, I would say try not to worry about that too much. There's definitely a path there that you can find that navigates both of those constraints. Yeah, I think that, that path very much is present, you know, things, and at least like in the kind of AI job market, you know, things are probably better than they were, you know, five, 10 years ago. And, the sense that there's a little bit more kind of value placed, I think, on you know seeing demonstrable like impact from from work, um, but I, I think it is still important for us to kind of think about how the the incentives that walking that line basically impose on the kinds of projects that that we can take on, um, because you know basically for the work that you're doing to really, you know, count towards your like academic career in some sense, like you want to be able to claim that you're developing like novel methods, right? You, like you want to be able to say like that you're advancing somehow like the science of machine learning or AI, you know, in addition to the impact that your work is having, you know, on in whatever kind of application domain that you're working in. And that's, you know, a wonderful goal, I think, you know, that we can, you know, sort of have you know, have our cake and eat it too, that, you know, we sort of advance, you know, all of these areas at once. And it's, it's wonderful when that happens. Um, but I think that also often like limits, like the way that we're able to engage with practitioners or people in, in other domains, because we can only like really work on problems if there's like a pretty credible, like, you know, short-term expectation that it will, you know, turn into like the kind of problem that's like interesting to, to us from a computational perspective as well. And so I think that that's something where, you know, if we took like a little bit of a bigger perspective on what contributions, you know, are valued, then that would like add some wiggle room, right? Like it's okay for, you know, not every project to work out in like exactly that, that sort of narrative. Um, and then that would, 
enable, I think, like us to engage a lot more effectively with, you know, with people outside of computer science and ultimately have more impact. Uh, thank you for the for the reactions. I also have some questions regarding like aligning the same topic. So like we, we do work on a lot of uh, like social impact like challenges. We try to implement algorithms and, and talk to domain experts trying to understand the, the problems. But how do I know whether I really know the domain enough and also the algorithm that de develop like there's no bias and also discrimination in the algorithm. In particular, I guess I'm this is this question was motivated from I guess the nice work on Google search that I guess Google search was like the the at least in my mind was that this likely algorithm to have bias because it's using using like the the patch bank and also some other advanced algorithm. I was not able to imagine there's bias and also discrimination or some kind of similar things in, in Google search. So perhaps deny you could like since you mentioned like auditing algorithm is like one of your uh, research and also from from your perspective and also from human computer interaction perspective maybe you can like give us a brief like summary of your work and also tell us how to monitor and also how to audit those algorithms in particular working with domain experts yeah sure so um in the work that you're referring to there is um, a study that i did a couple of years ago looking at uh, the types of people that appear in, in Google image search results when you look for results for certain occupations. And so, you know, what we find is that indeed people of color and women are, are sort of underrepresented in search results relative to, for the result of some particular occupation, relative to how those types of people are actually, you know, uh, represented in the workforce. So we say, you know, actually over half of bartenders are women, but if you do a search for bartender, you're gonna see very few women and so on. And the reason for this, of course, is like, although Google search is a huge and ubiquitous system that has tons of data to rely on and lots of good algorithmic backing, uh, the data that exists is itself a, a social byproduct. What kinds of photos get taken and uploaded online and what kinds of uh, content people look at I've done sort of similar audits looking at um, political bias actually in, in web search results. And the same principles apply there. You know, the kinds of content that even exist for an algorithm to draw on are social byproducts. And so the, the social biases that we see should appear there too, in fact. Um, and the second part of this study that I did was to actually look at what effect this has on people when you show them these different kinds of search results, both how does it make them think differently about the world you know, if we show someone some results that look with X demographic breakdown or Y, does that change their belief about how, how people are represented in that field? And also, does it change their belief about whether they themselves could take that job, could go into that occupation? The point being, of course, that as we consume algorithmic content, it shapes our ideas about what the world looks like because we interact with so much of the world digitally. And it also shapes our ideas about what kinds of people we are and what we could do, you know, our place in the world. And so for both of those reasons, it becomes really important to understand the human impact of these kinds of technologies. Um, so my um, thought about evaluation and, and how to interact with sort of partners uh, in nonprofit space or in government is that actually there are many cases in which uh, people out in the world care about the results of some algorithm. I've had really uh, one recent experience I had, for instance, was working with the New York City Commission on Human Rights. And they had a case where uh, a certain social media platform, I think this is actually public now, this went public a few weeks ago. So Tumblr was uh, acquired by Yahoo and rolled out a bunch of new policies around what kind of content could appear on that site and couldn't. And it turns out that some of those policies that were being sort of algorithmically uh, implemented were biased against people of minority genders and sexualities. And that's again, an underlying social bias that, you know, culturally, socially, we have associated certain groups with being, uh, in, you know, not safe for work, inappropriate for the social sphere, kind of uh, uh, othered those people, marginalized those people. And so we see that those same social problems were being reflected in this algorithm. Um, in this case, the New York City Commission on Human Rights was interested in understanding like what kinds of asks can they make of this platform in order to show that this problem has been fixed. 
because it's also easy, I think, in some of these cases for some problem to be identified and then for the organization, you know, the institution in question to kind of wave their hands and say that they're doing something differently. But if no one has the technical expertise to show up and say like, no, in fact, like here are the metrics that you need to meet. Can we evaluate these over time? We're never gonna see improvement. So algorithm audits are one way to do that. But the other thing that's really important that I'm sort of moving towards in my work is ongoing monitoring. These technologies, you know, in, in behavioral and social science, there's the concept of replication. Replication means we expect the underlying phenomenon has not changed, it should still exist. Let's run this study again and see if it does, because you know, if not, then maybe it says that the original study was flawed. In this space, instead, what we care about is something that I call reapplication. We expect that the underlying system has changed, and we need to be doing this kind of reapplication of the audit or ongoing monitoring to verify that the, the changes are for the good, that uh, some improvements that have been theoretically made are actually continuing, or to identify problems sort of like as they arise in real time instead of kind of in a one-off way, you know, after like some particular PR draws attention to, to a particular issue. So th those are kinds of my thoughts on, on auditing and monitoring. Thank you for the feedback. Lin, could you comment on like some, like give some feedback because you work on like public policy as well. It's like, I believe you have a lot of experience to, to, talk, to talk about, uh, to talk with public policy maker. And I believe they also have the same concept about having bias in the algorithm and how do they like, uh, like what, what's the way that you would resolve this issue in, in policy making? So with my work, I was mostly, um engage with policymakers around the question of how we can make AI be a tool for addressing climate change on the one hand and how we can also address the impact of climate change. So that's like a whole different um, side of AI, but um, that's what, what I know most about. So I'm, I'm probably best to talk about this topic instead. Um, so here, a lot of policymakers are actually or are interested in um, funding research at the center section. So um, a lot of conversations are about how do we shape funding programs that, that actually provide us with impactful work at the center section? What are the criteria? And then um, there's a big question around um, how do we think about the impacts overall? And I recently wrote a paper together with a number of colleagues on impact assessment of AI, but um, greenhouse gas emissions impacts. And um, here there are both the computational impacts, so they're also called direct impacts of AI, and the indirect impacts through the applications. Um, and we set up a framework of how one can think about, um, we mostly looked at machine learning, so machine learning's impact. Um, there are very, um, there it's really interesting because the impacts are really poorly understood. And that's something, I mean, Dinay, you mentioned that um, you work on, or you're interested in digital advertising and their um, impacts. And um, that's also something that was on, or is on our radar, um, trying to understand how do these really big industry applications of AI actually play out in terms of greenhouse gas emissions impacts because we always think about those applications in the energy sector or you know, that have direct um, connection with sustainability. But what we should really also think about is what, what is the sustainability impact of those big scale applications that are really prevalent in industry. Um, and yeah, we, I think we're still really in the beginnings of that currently in terms of research and also in terms of practice. Um, so that's really an important um, aspect also for policymakers. And um, still, it's important that one already makes policies trying to address these things, even if one cannot measure them. Um, so in the AI Act, um, they are trying to integrate environment as a criterion in the latest draft that is now a year old, actually. They published it a year ago. So they're still reshaping it. Um, there was almost no mention of um, climate change or the environment as a criterion. Um, it was mentioned in terms of an application area, but not in the legislation itself. And so um, policymakers are working on trying to integrate um, that as a criterion, especially for classifying um, AI systems as high risk, um, which is like a central mechanism in the policy um, for regulating AI. So, so yeah, my, my, my work is mostly focused on, on bringing 
climate change and, and environmental issues sort of um, also to the table and integrating it with AI ethics in that sense. Going off of Lynn's um, comment just now, what other application domains, what other challenges do we do you all see um, as problems that where AI could really contribute, as competition could really contribute, that perhaps we're not putting enough effort in at the moment? And this could be some anything as broad as education as an entire field or um, something much more specific. That's always a difficult one, I think. <laughs> um, so I wrote down biodiversity, but it's also not an area that I'm very familiar with. So other people might feel like um, there's a lot of um, work on that. Um, I know of a lot of work, but I feel like um, there could be more. Um, of course, from my perspective, also energy efficiency and especially like those industry sectors that are maybe not as attractive, like heavy industry, freight sector, these kind of industries um, that have a lot of data in part um, might benefit from um, energy efficiency applications. If they are correctly incentivized, they, those also occur and they might have a need for um, AI researchers or AI practitioners um, getting involved with them. With some ideas. Uh, so, from what I can see, there's a lot of opportunities in the space of AI for social impact, and you can expect that for the application domains per se that are that have more commercial benefit and more direct commercial benefit, there would be more work that has been or effort that has been devoted to that domains, and for the domains that has less or more indirect uh, commercial benefits, there will be less effort uh, devoted to those. And to my, uh, what uh, in terms of what I can see, those are a lot of opportunities in those areas as well. Could you say, could you elaborate more on um, like what you have been working on, like wildlife conservation and also why, like, like what, what, what did you find in food, food security and also food rescue as well? Yeah, so like, I think in wildlife conservation, in, wild, uh, in food security, these are all examples where we see as like, they may not have direct uh, uh, commercial benefits or, or at least to revenues for the organization or anything. And, uh, but there are very there are very important like societal impacts, and uh, there are a lot of opportunities there that we can do. But it is indeed a a, a challenge to find out the exact uh, problem to work on, uh, and also to find the the kind of the organizations to work with. Um, that's not an easy thing to address it would take time it need, need, sometimes would take years to build the trust between the ai experts and the domain experts and it might take months to really pin down the very first problem that seems to be interesting to both sides to work on yeah i'm also curious about like whether you found any bias or underrepresentation in the in these two domains, for example, like wildlife conservation and also I guess in particular food security, because we are actually allocating limited resources to people. And there could be a lot of bias or uh, underrepresentation in the algorithms. And probably not only just the algorithm, probably from the domain expert or from the from any part of the, the process. Could you say a few words on that as well? Yes, that's actually a very good question. So let me just use the food rescue as an example. Uh, the, the food rescue platform that we're working with uh, is actually quite typical. It has a three uh, parties per se, like three types of users, the donors, the recipients, and the volunteers. 
So as a platform, the first thing the platform does is to match the donors with the recipients. The second thing the platform is doing is to match the donor recipient pair with volunteers so that the volunteer can pick up the food from the donor, send it to the recipient. So for both these two levels of matching, you can see that there is potential bias uh, or potential unfairness uh, for the matching between donors and recipients, uh, especially on the recipient side, like what kind of donation you would send to different type of recipients. Clearly there might be, if, if the, the matching algorithm is not done in a careful way, then it's possible that these recipients are not getting what they need or some recipients just don't get as much uh, food for, uh, compared to some uh, other uh, recipients. And then to the second stage where you match the food uh, donor recipient pair with the volunteers, then there also might be some kind of bias. Maybe some volunteers get favored uh, by the matching algorithm while some other uh, volunteers are kind of completely ignored by the um, matching algorithm. So these two levels of matching both involve some, potentially involve some kind of bias. And um, I guess that's all some, that's also some opportunities that we can potentially address. I know that Professor Ariel Pocachia has been working with uh, people and trying to see how to uh, reduce the potential unfairness issues here and to kind of incentivize uh, recipients to uh, share more information about their true needs. Uh, and um, that's some direction to further explore as well, I believe. So far, oh, yeah, sorry, go ahead. Yeah. I, I think building off um, all of this work on food security and this uh, close work with nonprofits, um, I will point to two questions asked by two separate anonymous um, listeners. So the first is, um, what do you look for when you partner with a nonprofit organization? And then a related question is, how do you pay or compensate these partners for their time and um, how do you deal with differences in resources and power dynamics with these partners? Um, I'll maybe ask Brian to start. Yeah, so for the first question, um, you know, how, you know, how I look, you know, or, or what I look for in, in partners. I mean, a, a lot of it is really, um, you know, so first it's some combination of, you know, that, you know, I sort of believe in, you know, what they're doing, right? You know, like obviously I'm not an expert in the domain, but, you know, at least, you know, try to make some initial impression that, you know, they're doing work that seems valuable. But then beyond that, really just that, you know, the sort of match in interests and excitement, right? And, you know, ability really to, you know, spend a, a long amount of time, right? Like working on something together and the fact, and, and I think there needs to be just like a sense from the partner organization that this is really something that's important enough to them, right? That they see enough value in it, that it's, it's really worth um, kind of engaging deeply and, and spending time over over the course of years to, to try to make something happen that's that's impactful. Um, and in terms of how those organizations are are compensated, um, so typically I so I, I don't think that AI researchers are typically like the ones you know paying an organization to do the work, right? Like this organization has funding to offer services or to do whatever you know or to offer whatever programs they're doing, and so you basically have to make a case that you know working with with you is a will advance those goals, right? It's something that they should be doing with their their time given the resources that they have. And then, you know, sometimes there's the opportunity, right, to apply for funding together, right? You know, to, you know, to, to specifically support work on a given project. And that's something where, you know, I think is is really wonderful, you know, when it's available, right? Um, but um, yeah, typically it's it's not that you're paying them somehow. Um, and in terms of the power dynamics that result, I mean, there's really nothing that's forcing them to work with you, right? They can just start, <laughs> stop replying to your, to your emails and do whatever thing they were already doing before you got there. Um, so at least I think in terms of like particular, uh, in, in terms of like academic collaborations that I've seen so far, um, I don't think that you have like a particularly unusual amount of like leverage over them somehow. Yeah, so I, I, I think from my perspective, the second question is easier, like, for all the collaborations that we had, we don't really pay the nonprofit organizations, except that sometimes when we are running a pilot study and then there that pilot study involves some kind of 
extra money or, or human effort. And maybe if we have funding, we can use that funding to support part of it. But for most of the part, it's like, it's just a collaboration and they're not paying us, we're not paying them. Um, and for the first question, what we are looking for when we try to work with the nonprofit, I believe there are two questions here <laughs> embedded. One question is, uh, how do we select the nonprofit organization to work with? The second is after we had a nonprofit uh, collaboration, uh, uh, collaborator, how do we pin down the problem? So for the first question, how do we pick the collaborator or the nonprofit partner? Uh, there are uh, like there are some conditions that would make the collaboration easier. For example, as I mentioned, not all the nonprofit organizations actually have the IT infrastructure. Some of them don't even have data scientists or uh, software engineers. If they do have data scientists and software engineer, it would actually make the collaboration much easier because that means they have the database of recording historical data that they have collected and they have this uh, code base of supporting their current operation. And that means if we introduce uh, additional AI techniques to improve the efficiency, uh, we can just make changes to their current code base and to test how much improvement it can lead to. Um, and that's like the, the like that's the first factor that will make the collaboration easier. The second factor is their willingness. It's like if they're very open-minded and they they want to work with researchers and to bring more technology to their uh, daily operation, that will make things much easier. Comparing to the case where the uh, organizations would like would be like, uh, okay, I'm I'm happy with our current way of doing things. I'm not super interested in technology or in introducing new technology. That would make things much much harder. Uh, and the third part, uh, element is like also their willingness to uh, not only just having one or two meetings with you, but really devote uh, enough resources in terms of time, effort, and all kinds of things to the collaboration and even run the pilot study. Like we, ideally we want the, their early commitment that, okay, we want to work with you and we, we are willing to have this pilot study run together with you. And if that's the case, that will make the collaboration much, uh, much, prom much more promising. And then for the second question is like, okay, if we have already pinned down a collaborator or partner, how can we find the exact problem to work on? Uh, for this part, what we are looking for here is we want to find a problem that is indeed valuable to them. Meaning like, yes, they don't make money for the nonprofits, but they may have some kind of KPIs. Uh, so for example, for the re food rescue platforms, they care about the claim rate, meaning for all the rescue requests, how many of them will be successfully completed um, by the volunteers. This is one important factor that they care about. So if that's the case, then you want to find a problem that really help them to improve their KPIs per se. Uh, and also, you want to find a problem that is addressable by AI. Meaning, if this is a problem that is important to them, but it's mostly, it should be addressed through policy level changes, not just technical level changes, it will be harder to uh, de develop an AI-based tool to help them. Uh, and the third thing is, okay, if let's say, this is something that AI can potentially address, but AI, to address this problem, the AI, technique needs this much input and they cannot provide such input, then again, that's not going to be a good problem. So you also need to find a problem where it is feasible to develop an AI, like the feasibility is based on the data available and uh, other kind of resource available. So that's what I see as some of the important factors there. Okay, so I think we have one another question from our audience. This question is uh, about how do you feel about the framing of social impact coming from the business or corporate interest? Is there another way to frame this 
uh, space that you prefer. I think I will nominate deny. In particular, I guess I'm interested in how you view this like social impact from human computer interactions perspective. Yeah, <laughs> um, I think we've all seen sort of a trend in recent years towards uh, something like social impact um, becoming a you know a buzzword or like a trend, something that industry says that they care about now. Something I was noticing, for instance, that I have like a half baked. I don't know, 30% of the way their project on is um, that like a couple of years ago, Google Maps started uh, adding flags for businesses to mark them as being like woman owned or black owned or LGBTQ friendly or something. And um, I mean, I don't know, there are, there are various reasons why this might be a good or a bad idea. The reason that this caught my attention was that I was seeing like full spread, you know, like two page ads for this in the New Yorker, which like, at least for me, I'm thinking like, if you want to have a positive impact on the world by like letting people know that some, you know, a business is like black owned or something, is it the most effective use of your money to then like take out full spreads in the New Yorker? Or is this like, I mean, to me, obviously this smells like PR. That's exactly the kind of audience like me reading the New Yorker that like wants to see this kind of ad. Uh, we'll get back to the topic of advertising. So I think that there is a, a move, you know, to, to try to rebrand some of the efforts that companies are making as being like actually for social good. The problem of course, is that First of all, some of these efforts are just not that. They're something else that helps the company in some other way. It doesn't actually have some kind of positive impact. Maybe it's just neutral. The risk of course is like just neutral is we can argue about neutral, but in some cases it's actually gonna have a negative impact. When we know for instance, that there are parts of the country or the world in which uh, racism is widespread or homophobia, having some businesses labeled as black owned or LGBTQ friendly or something could actually have really negative impacts. This is something that businesses themselves are opting into doing. So they're not required to do it. Right. And that's good. Um, but it's not totally clear, like how those flags are going to be used, what kind of attention is going to be drawn to it. In a similar case, actually, uh, some black creators found that during black history month, they were being featured very prominently on YouTube's homepage. And then they got a bunch of harassment at which there was not initially like extra resources at the ready to handle. Um, so there are these sorts of instances in which companies or corporate interests especially want to put like a social equity spin on something that they're doing, but because they haven't really deeply engaged with the stakeholders involved, as we've been saying from the beginning of this panel, and they haven't understood like what are the very real risks in this space? How can you mitigate those risks? Or in some cases, like don't do the PR thing because the risks are too great or because groups aren't asking for it, you know, without having done that kind of real, um, you know, invested discussion with stakeholders, uh, many of these efforts are going to fall flat or worse. Um, in terms of whether there's a framing that I prefer more, um, I just wish they wouldn't <laughs> in a lot of these cases, you know, if that's not what some, uh, some uh, corporate practice is doing, then try not to, to pink wash it or, you know, um, to, to make it seem like it's invested in, in some idea of social equity that it's not. That's that's a, a pie in the sky kind of ask. Obviously corporate interests are gonna do the thing that looks best for them and, and they have whole departments involved in doing PR. So that's not a, a real you know a request that I can make, but I think these kinds of uh, instances are important to pay attention to. Um, as they shape our understanding of like what's really going on under the hood. And in some cases, like with this, this project, we were, we've sort of started collecting reviews for, for businesses that have this tag to try to see whether, you know, they're getting like more spammy reviews, whether like average ratings are changing over time due to this kind of label in good or bad ways. Sometimes paying attention to these sorts of trends in corporate America or, you know, globally can um, sometimes yield interesting research questions too. Yeah, thank you for the feedback. That, that's super helpful. Uh, we also had uh, one question from the audience uh, about how does this academia space need to change to facilitate and enable more so impactful projects and programs? This is, I guess, like 
No, that question is about from, from the company's perspective. I guess this question is about from academia perspective. So maybe Brian, you can take, take the questions. Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of it is, you know, really just kind of changing the like, like still, you know, some of the incentive structure and, you know, how we think of, you know, what constitutes a contribution in, in our discipline, right? You know, and I think, you know, it is like, a meaningful shift in you know your sense of like you know what does it mean to like be a computer scientist even to say that like well actually you know part of what we care about is really just you know the way that computation is you know used in you know the outside world and the impact that it has and trying to make that impact beneficial right like that is you know like you know maybe a substantive difference from like you know a very sort of like traditional view of like oh you know you build systems and analyze their theoretical properties so that's kind of the extent of it you know but then if you if you make that shift then you know, you can recognize a broader set of contributions. And then I think that like really is sort of like the like underlying issue behind a lot of, you know, then kind of like smaller points like, oh, it's difficult to recruit students or it's hard to find funding or there's, it's hard to like find appropriate publication venues, right? Then, you know, because really those are all just like reflections of the way that people, you know, evaluate different kinds of contributions. You know, if we collectively decided to place more emphasis on, the, the impact of our work, then, you know, publication venues that, you know, cared more about impact would be seen as, you know, higher status to publish in, you know, for example, right? So that's really how I think of the, like, the underlying, you know, sort of issue. And I think it's something that's improving over time, right? But it's, um, you know, it's still maybe like not, you know, that's sort of awareness is not exactly where we'd like it to be yet. Uh, I think what I can see is that um, many of the universities, as uh, the other panelists also mentioned, do care about the impact of the work. Um, and I guess it's not only just from the evaluation system, but also from the uh, training of the students perspective, like, uh, yes, they're, they're, they're doing this kind of AI for social impact project. and. It's kind of like a high risk, high reward thing because no one can guarantee you that your work can really be deployed and the deployment would definitely lead to significant, like great success or significant improvement. Uh, so like from my perspective, I feel that it makes sense to also have some kind of mixture of this kind of high risk, high rewarding project and also uh, some projects that are dealing with the more fundamental uh, problems in AI. This fundamental problems can be motivated from the problem that you work, work on, or could be some like related but uh, other problems that the, the 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 research community has been pushing for. So uh, that's what I see here. Zooming out a little bit from. Uh, academia specifically, I wanted to to um, raise one of the, the questions I think Milan um, asked, which is what is the biggest obstacle in your mind for AI for social impact research? Um, and I wanted to ask Lynn um, in particular, because uh, I thought that you could perhaps add your perspective as well on what your efforts um, in the climate change for AI, climate, climate change AI initiative um, is doing to kind of uh, fill that gap and overcome those obstacles. Yeah, thanks for asking that question. And I think that was, um, you phrased it also before, what, what can be done to get more people or to lower the, the cost of entry to this field. Um, and that's really something that climate change AI is um, trying to do for, for the climate change related applications. And um, we all felt um, the need to found that organization because I think we experienced different kinds of barriers. So me coming more from the domain side, I experienced a lot of skepticism around um, machine learning applications, not a lot of, um, well, I had a lot of support in terms of advising because I was at CMU, but I knew that in other places that would be way different and that a lot of more theoretical researchers would also not be interested in this kind of applied um, problems that, that, you know, you need to be sort of on the applied side for the most part if you are working on this kind of problems. Um, and then other people working on machine learning or coming from the machine learning side felt, yeah, not the right incentives to 
start with these projects. We talked about a lot of them today. Um, I think the most um, obvious one is that projects just take so much longer and you need, yeah, you need so many more partners. Um, you can't publish at the same rate. And I think also advisors, for example, might actively discourage you or require you to have a, you know, three real CS papers, and then you can also do the thing that you actually like to do. Um, I've, I've seen all of that. So I think with, with Climate Change AI, we wanted to build um, not only for academia, but um, we started off with academia, sort of a space for people to, to discuss their research incentives. Um, we, so with the workshops, um, that's a place where you can um, showcase your research, you can um, submit um, workshop papers, and um, that alone, like, set a signal, like, this is a thing. There are other people working on this, and um, this is real research that, that people look towards, too. And then um, I think what's also really important is, of course, funding. That's why we have a grants program um, and role models in the community that, you know, other, you know that other people are working on the same kind of thing, and you feel part of more like a new research area um, as opposed to, um, being alone in, in, in your respective field and, and doing the, the strange thing that, that you happen to be interested in. Um, and then another important part is having, yeah, material for class projects and hackathons and so on. So people can get from, get like acquainted with, with these kind of different application areas. And maybe that might inspire them to, um, think about going into this field or, or, you know, think about the right kind of sectors so that they could apply to and so on. Um, so for the innovation grants program that we have with Climate Change AI, we required um, to make data sets publicly available. Um, so it's primarily a research project, but with the research project, there has to be a newly, like a newly labeled or collected data set that is relevant to the respective question that then gets published. So um, new students, for example, can take that paper and can base a class projects, class project on that or um, hackathons can use that. So that was sort of the idea around that. Yeah. Uh, two cents from me. Uh, I think based on our experience, there has been two modes that has led to some level of success in terms of getting a AI for social impact project started and uh, proceed. One mode is this kind of platform-based matching. <laughs> so uh, thanks to the Google's AI for social good workshop that is actually led uh, by Melind uh, and other folks at Google, um, in this kind of workshops, it brings together the AI researchers and the nonprofit organizations and the platform commits to provide some funding for the successful matches. And this gives people the incentive to come to our workshop. And uh, it makes the matching also easier because uh, it's like there is committed resources. If you can find a match, then you will get the resource and continue doing that work. So I think if we can have more such uh, initiative, it will be super helpful. Uh, and another thing that we found useful is that we kind of have a successful story and then we try to email other organizations that might have a similar task or a similar problem. And we tell them that, oh, here's our successful story. We have done this. We have been su successful working with this organization. And we believe that what you're doing have some similarity to what we have been done uh, or what our collaborating organization has been done. So are you interested in having a conversation with us to see what uh, we can do here? And I feel that for this kind of uh, approach to scale, it could be helpful if we build some kind of database or catalog of the nonprofit organizations and to like label them with what kind of things they're doing and uh, what kind of resources that they have based on the public information and what kind of data they might have according to what they see. Um, and so that if there is some successful stories, like let's say we have built this food rescue uh, platform, uh, assistance tool that we can go to this uh, database and to search for other organizations that are doing food security 
food uh, rescue, and then we can at least get an email list so that we can email them uh, directly. So that's another possibility that I think could lower the barrier. Um, and the third thing is like, just to echo what Lin said, uh, is more like an educational effort. Uh, this educational educational efforts is for both sides. One is for AI researchers or for students in CS to expose them to this, like these existing work on AI for social good um, through classes, lectures, talks, all kind of things. And the, the other side is like for to the nonprofit organizations, if we can uh, like volunteer ourselves to give talks to them, to introduce to them what are the existing technologies, what has been the successful stories of using AI to help those nonprofit organizations, they might be more open-minded or more willing to try out uh, some AI techniques. So yeah, that's all I can think about for now. Thank you for the for the for your for your answers. I think we have one more, one final question from the audience. We only had time for one final question from the audience. This question I also be really curious about is about how to identify what constraints are hard constraints or soft constraints. And also how hard is it to identify what initially hard constraint can be modeled as a soft constraint instead in your optimization province. And in particular, I'm also curious whether this is like an algorithmic questions or whether this should be addressed by the HCI perspective. So maybe I, I will have Brian answer this question and then Dina can maybe comment later. Yes, yeah, so I mean, figuring out what constraints are hard versus soft. I mean, it's definitely, yeah, I mean, I, I wouldn't say it's an AI question, right? It's a question like talking to the people who are going to be using the, the system and you know, asking them like, you know, would you, you know, would you trade off some violation of this constraint to get more of other things, right? And that's something that really depends on their situation. Um, so, yeah, that's my take. Maybe uh, Denai has something more more informed to, to say. Yeah, I would just say that like sometimes in the systems that I'm studying, you know, because I'm thinking about the effect on people, this is maybe more a note on, uh, you know, what it is you're optimizing for. Um, yeah, I guess maybe that more than the constraints specifically, but I think they're related. Um, when you think about what to optimize for, there might be multiple different metrics that are equally important mm -hmm. and they might not necessarily agree. So we might find, for instance, when I'm thinking about like this work auditing uh, different algorithms for how they represent different people of race and gender, we might find that one outcome metric we care about is whether we give people a realistic view of the world and we show them something that is actually true. The other question we might have is like, actually, how do they feel about that? Does this make them feel a greater sense of belonging, a greater amount of self-confidence, or actually does it make it feel, does it make them feel worse about themselves? These two things might be at odds because unfortunately in the world we live in, when you see that the way it is, you might feel bad. <laughs> and so it becomes, you know, this is like a, a bit of a playful way to phrase it, but it really is a difficult thing to think about what kind of systems we want to build when we have these sort of competing interests that we think are sort of both important and we're not sure necessarily like which one to pick. In my own work, you know, the, the strategy that I have is basically to be studying a wide range of these different outcomes and to try to understand actually the positive and negative impacts that can be occurring at the same time. Um, but for anyone who's doing this kind of work, especially in industry where you might wanna actually implement something, but even in academia, there are a lot of normative decisions that go into um, making some of these choices. Normative meaning uh, it's your sort of opinion about what is correct and good to be done. And that's something that the field might agree on, but there might not be a domain-wide or, or a, an industry-wide understanding for what's like the normative correct thing. So this is also like a short plug that I just wanted to make sure that I leave at the end here for anyone who's sort of interested in going into this kind of line of work and is an early scholar. I think it's really critical to get an interdisciplinary education. You should be studying social sciences, humanities, other sciences, you know, whatever your interest is drawn to alongside your technical education. Um, in my own experience, I double majored in CS and STS, science, technology studies in undergrad. And that's kind of what brought me to thinking about these normative questions, thinking about how science and technology are produced and what impacts they have. So aside from, you know, making you a better and deeper thinker, 
uh, having this kind of interdisciplinary background is also going to help you identify important questions. And I think you'll find that in many other fields, there's a great eagerness to work with people who have technical skills. You know, there's no lack, as we've seen from this panel, uh, of, of questions to be asked. And um, when you have the right connections into those specific groups, you know how to ask better questions and, and they will really welcome you, I think, um, very eagerly, you know. So, so that's, um, you know, kind of the last, the plug that I would wanna make on this point, which maybe has taken us a little bit farther from the initial question, but it's something I wanted to make sure to point out. That is so perfect, and I especially because um, with that, um, we wanted to start closing up, but also to give each of you an opportunity to share any last takeaways or things that you um, weren't able to mention. And in particular, I wanted to ask this question about what advice would you give to early career researchers who are, want to work at AI for Social Impact? So Denai already hit that, if there's anything else you want to share, but let's go back in the same order that um, we started off with in the introduction. So Faye, if you would like to start. Uh, so say it again. Is a summary? Sorry, I was paying to attention to the chat. So, <laughs> if you have um, any takeaways that you weren't able to mention before, or uh, advice for early career researchers. Yeah. So I guess my advice is, uh, like, for early career researchers, not only uh, be aware that the the work on AI for social impact could be high risk, high reward, and uh, I would suggest that. Uh, also, like when you look work on these problems and trying to kind of bring your work to uh, make societal impact, uh, also uh, consider like that either the generalized the general how general the technique you develop is to other potential domains, uh, and to make it not just for this particular problem, but to derive something that is more general purpose, or uh, to work on some fundamental problems that. Uh, like is related to what you're doing, but uh, can have more general purpose. Uh, so that's one advice that I would provide. And the other one is I hope that uh, we can have we can have more uh, platforms, databases, or whatever that is to help lower the barrier to work on AI for social impact problems in the future. Thanks so much, Lynn. I actually had um, some thoughts on, on the last question that was there. Um, and I think we should also take this a bit further and really think about how people are using the results that we produce, um, especially these multi-stakeholder processes are really tricky. And I mean, just to share a story that I encountered on a project that I worked on during my PhD, I provided um, uncertainty around a forecast. And I was talking to people who could potentially use these was like in that case, price forecasts. Um, and um, the person said, yeah, it's great if we have better forecasts, but you know, the price forecasts are set by the stakeholders. Everybody comes in with their own forecast in mind and, um, and that's a negotiation process. So um, it doesn't even, it might help to inform that if you have actually a better forecast, but ultimately it's, it's like a, a political process. So, I mean, things like that, then, yeah, you don't even talk about it. Are these constraints? Like, it's like, how, how are our results even useful? Um, so multi-stakeholder processes and how to in integrate them with AI solutions, I think are, are still, um, it's an interesting area. And um, in terms of um, what, to, what to do if you are interested in working on these problems, I think um, Dina put that really well. Um, you should study the area that you're interested in, at least to some degree, because it's going to go a really long way. I mean, it's going to help you so much addressing the problems if you have a little bit of domain knowledge and that, and if you have a broader view um, into other disciplines and how people may think about problems and how to address them in other disciplines. So I think that that is really helpful. Um, for working in that area. And then um, also picking an area because you know social good is so broad. Um, all of these problem areas are tied to at least one domain or one field of study even, and probably even several fields of study. So um, pick 
one i think is is helping a lot or pick several but i mean don't don't um, get carried away and just trying to have impact all over the place i think it really helps to specialize in, in some area thanks so much um brian if you want to uh put in something short yeah so i mean i think the like what lynn and denai and and Faye mentioned about sort of interdisciplinary work in education is really important and you know both in terms of the future of AI for social impact I think is you know much more in terms of like not thinking of ourselves just as like AI researchers who are going to work in some other domain but as researchers who have like a set of skills that spans you know both some piece of AI but also some piece of just the process of you know actually designing and deploying and evaluating you know interventions that have a beneficial impact right which requires techniques from other field right and that's both the distinctive set of competencies as a researcher right that we need to sort of recognize and then also for early career students um yeah i mean definitely interdisciplinary education is is important and i would also specifically highlight um beyond learning about application domains having a fairly wide uh view of the methodological landscape right no not just learning about the most recent thing in machine learning but also learning about statistics or econometrics or optimization right and the sort of like wider landscape because really you know the real world is very complicated right and so and having this kind of bigger toolbox and you know wider lens to you know see see the world and model it is ultimately really important and i want to close things off yeah sure so you know having said um most of the the concluding thoughts i had um i think the the highest level theme for me that I've heard throughout this whole panel is the importance of doing work that's really um, situated on the ground, that directly interacts with stakeholders from the very beginning of the project. And rather than trying to come up with some techno solutionist patch that we're going to put on top of some real world problem, instead to be drawing our inspiration uh, from the beginning of our training all the way through the individual research projects that we do now, with the the framework in mind that we want to have some you know genuine positive impact on the world and that starts with the world and eventually we get to the impact so i think if we really ground ourselves in the uh results that we want to have the kind of world that we want to look towards and we want to build and we put in serious time answering those questions for ourselves um you know in in philosophical ways and in social ways interpersonal ways, when we start to really imagine what the future is that we want to, to work towards, then we can try to, you know, make good connections with others that allow us to take steps in that direction. Thanks so much. And with that, uh, we'll close things off. We really appreciate all of you, Fei, Lynn, Denai, and Brian for taking the time. Um, and thank you all for being here and asking such thoughtful questions from the audience. Thank you so much for inviting us. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you for having us.